Okay, so um, some of the some of the lectures that we run, we I ask you to watch something before. So last week we had a short lecture, and I ask you to watch um, to watch the. uh the critical thinking lectures and check uh the write-up on the academic uh voice i see that this is kind of formatted not nicely so i'll just quickly change that um additional so then the, those ballot points will be kind of nicely formatted yeah um so how many of you did that um uh, did you all watch uh watch it mm, yeah some people watched it some didn't um Okay, so if you haven't watched everything, that's okay. You can catch up. Um, it's not, it's not super prohibitive of not uh, have watched it, but it helps. Uh, so today's lecture, what we gonna do is we gonna discuss a little bit about critical thinking, about uh, approach to research, and approach to doing a systematic literature review in the second half. Uh, so can you tell me why we are spending? um why we are spending today on, on discussing that why we just don't jump into talking about technology and mobile and some research questions related to uh, to the to the domain instead we we spend some time discussing kind of a formalism about reasoning about uh, talking about arguments and claims and statements and why, why we kind of cover some aspects of critical thinking. Um, yeah, so um, I, uh, regarding the setup, so, so Benjamin is uh, uh, saying he didn't know that he should watch. Uh, uh, the setup is probably, it's probably my fault because I should have issued an, an issue and kind of tell everybody that uh, uh, you guys should watch those videos. I will do that next time. So it's it's kind of my, my fault. Um, I, I, I said about it in the class, uh, but you know, not everybody is in the class and not everybody is watching the videos after the class. So if there is kind of a homework or something to do, I will make a use of issue tracker. So I will kind of announce it in the in the issue tracker. That will help, I hope. Um, okay, so Jon uh, is saying, I'm guessing why is why we spending time on the critical thinking is because uh, of how grounded it will be to uh, a good research paper. Um, yeah, any other? Any other suggestions of why we're spending time on this? Um, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the course is about research mainly, and the this topic is like any other topic that some agrees with, that some disagree with, that some say that maybe thinks that some part of it is uh, not ethical or ethical. So we need to study all the aspects before we go deep in it. Yeah. Very good. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I also think uh, perhaps it is because uh, by doing academic right kind of research or founding it in scientific evidence, then it gives us a common basis on discussing something uh, so that it is rooted in facts and actual statements and not opinions, and that it will be easier for us to understand and analyze issues and problems. Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that, that's an excellent summary also. So all, all the comments are kind of spot on. Um, the reason is that, you know, um, next year you will be working on your thesis. This year you will be working on papers which require you to write reports. And in all those activities, you have to be quite precise and quite well organized logically to 
uh, defend your arguments and to structure your presentations in such a way that they form kind of a defendable arguments. Um, and getting a little bit of a background on how this reasoning, how the inference is, is done will help you to be a better researcher, to make your write-up better, better organized, and to make your claims kind of um, supported by evidence or your arguments, should I say. Um, we don't have to use the terms extremely precisely all the time um, in this lecture. Uh, so we are not uh, necessarily focusing here on the rigor and on the research itself. We're focusing here mostly on the domain, um, but having this background on in critical thinking is useful. So that's why you know you don't need to finish the entire call course on critical thinking. You just need to get this kind of a fundamental aspects of it, um, and um, what those uh, first uh, two videos did. They introduced the terms like claim and statement and argument. Uh, and they prepared the sort of the foundations on how this is done. Um, the, this lecture is about um, inductive and deductive arguments. We will discuss it in a minute. Um, and then you can kind of carry it further and we will spend some time talking about fallacies as well. Some of the wrong arguments uh, which we should avoid in making while we writing our reports or wh while we writing our thesis. Uh, so I will cover um, fallacies kind of as a, as a last point. We're not gonna watch uh, those uh, three videos here. I expect you to watch them at home or you, you've already watched them. Um, we will check uh, this one. This one is quite straightforward. Um, at the end, this is about uh, using a, a specific academic register or academic voice when you're writing and preparing your reports. So we will do that um, after we, we've done the critical thinking bit. So my plan for today is to spend some time discussing and, and uh, learning about the, the fundamentals of critical thinking. Then we talk a little bit about the, the register for specific way of writing um, to avoid certain um, um, yeah, um, uh, cer certain patterns which are not typical for academic writing. Instead, using a certain register or certain um, uh, mechanisms which express us more succinctly or more clearly. And then in the second half, we will focus on systematic literature review and what it is and why we use it. Um, I think I have my phones and other notification mechanisms disrupting us a little bit. So let me just um, make things quiet. So apologies for that. All right, that should help. Okay, so now if you... Um, if I go here, just let me. Let me do this. So you should. Um, Why is not the one which I wanted present? Yeah, perfect. So uh, we will start talking the, uh, about the fundamental terms. So those of you who watched the video, uh, you can base your answer on what you've learned from the video, from the lecture. Those of you who haven't, just say what you think a claim is. Um, i give you a couple of moments. Uh, 
the answer to Benjamin, yes, this uh, lecture will be published in the GTL YouTube channel uh, IMT4306. Uh, and I will keep uh, all the videos recorded in the same channel, uh, same as last year. So I will also put it on the uh, on the wiki, the, the YouTube channel where the videos are. Good. So, <laughs> yeah, so we, we have some patterns emerging. Um, we have kind of those three or those four in the same category, uh, all those kind of in the same. So a statement that is either true or false. Um, and there is kind of a more of a rhetor rhetorical usage to achieve a certain effect. Um, we have a yeah, another way of saying that it's kind of a, a, a more of a rhetorical device. Um, so yeah, those are all correct. Um, we let's let's do um, let's do the next one, and we come back to this one in a moment. So. So is claim and statement the same thing? So in many definitions, you said a claim is a statement. Uh, so is claim and statement the same? What is the relationship? Okay, we have some uh, shared opinions here. Uh, some people keep it safe and say it depends. Some suggest that they might be the same. Uh, some saying no. So what is, uh, what is the relationship between a statement and a claim? What, what would you say? So Benjamin uh, is suggesting that a statement is a general thing, a uh, phrase that does not specify, specifically say if something is true or false, while a claim states that something is either true or false. Would you agree with that? You, you can uh, raise the hand if you agree. So how, how we uh, how we call this relationship? So if I if I say um, all all claims are statements, but not all statements are claims, what is the relationship between those two terms? Yeah, uh, Jon is suggesting that a statement can be true or false also, right? So there is a twist here. So a statement can be true or false. Um, a claim, according to the, some of those definitions, um, whoops, sorry, uh, can be true or false, right? So then that would mean that claim and statements are the same. But actually, a claim assumes it's you know a a, a claim can be wrong, but a claim is asserting that something is true. Um, so a claim, by definition of a claim, kind of asserts that something is true. It can be shown to be wrong, 
uh, which means the assertion is wrong. A statement can be either true or false. Um, and a statement, or all claims are statements, but there are other statements. For example, I have a description, or I have a question, or I have an explanation. Uh, and those would be statements in a form of a statement, but they would not be claims, right? So, um, yeah. Uh, Besnik says claims are a subgroup of statements. Yes, exactly. That's how it is. So statement is a larger category and claims are a subset. Um, and we have other types of statements uh, in our uh, writing. So we can use, you know, we usually use statements uh, to explain things. So we, we can have a description or explanation. We have statements in the form of a question. And then we have statements in the form of claims. Uh, and the specific thing about claims is that they assert that the statement is true, right? Um, all right, so let's move on. Um, so we, we um, established that claims and statements are not the same. Uh, statement is a broader category. Claims is a specific type of statements. Um, it depends, might be, uh, claimed to be true also, uh, because we can uh, say we are discussing claims and statements in the context of the colloquial use, not in the context of critical thinking use. And colloquially, uh, we often use both. Uh, so if you look up the, uh, the definition, so if I go uh, and say, let's do, Claim versus statement, uh, and if I go to a definition, um, yeah, like the first thing. Um, so we say um, a statement is a declaration or a remark, a presentation of an opinion. Uh, here we say a new statement of truth made by something, um, and if if you compare it, um, they are quite, um, yeah, so, so this is not what we mean. Like uh, we don't mean it in the context of ownership of land. So this is out of the current context of how we are discussing it. Uh, uh, we here say that it's a kind of a, a, a truth statement that needs to be verified. So even in colloquial kind of a dictionary usage there is some sort of a, a difference. So probably it depends, doesn't really depend on colloquial or kind of a formal use neither. So probably the only answer is, you know, they are not the same. Um, all right, so next. We have some quizzes now. Um, so the lead character in Sigella is a young girl living in miserable circumstances that abruptly become extraordinary after a night at a ball. Is it a claim or is it a statement? Um, so what would mean, yeah, let's, let's, let's leave it for now. Uh, let's do a couple of more, okay, um, to get kind of a feel. It, it, is, it is a statement. Uh, the time is a little bit short. I, I should have made the, the timer a little bit longer, but um, I hope it, it, <laughs> it will be sufficient for shorter questions. So here we have another one. What would be the, um, what type of a statement is that if, 
um yeah okay you know it, it is a claim <laughs> so but you know if it was an explanation then it would be kind of a statement right uh, so explanations or descriptions uh form of a statement which is not a claim uh, so this one is a claim it's clearly a claim because if you look at the structure of the statement it kind of asserts that the particular sport is the best sport um, and it asserts that it's true right so there is a truth assert as assertion um, and the the it doesn't kind of belong like you know it's not a question it's not a description it's not an explanation it it is yeah clearly a claim right uh so if we go back to the previous one um what um what would you say this is so the lead character in sigrella is a young girl living in a miserable circumstances that abruptly become extraordinary after a night at the ball if, if if you think about what this sentence says, what what is it? How how would you characterize it? Yeah, it is a description or it's an explanation. It, it's not really an explanation. It's rather a description. What a Cinderella is like the story, what it is about. It sort of says, well, there is a main character. Uh, she's living in miserable circumstances. And then suddenly those circumstances change at the ball. It's kind of a description. It's a summary of what the Cinderella story is. So if you read this, you can say, yeah, it, it is kind of like a description. So if it is a description, then it is a statement because it's not a claim, right? Makes sense. It's a summary. Yeah, very, um, very good, Elizabeth. So another one, let's pick this one. I have to press the button to start this. This is a short one as well, so it should be easy. Yeah, it's a claim. Um, it's a statement which asserts something is true, uh, and it's uh, clearly a claim. Um, what's the difference between claims and opinions? So uh, Benjamin says it doesn't start with I think. Uh, Lama says opinions can be claims and both are true. So it could be an opinion uh, if it was attached to somebody who has that opinion. Uh, if there was a, an, you know, uh, a person saying that, uh, then you could treat it as an opinion. But if it's said like this, it's a claim because we can't really say of whose opinion is that, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Um, good, good commentary in the, uh, in the chat. So let's see how you guys doing. Yeah quite uh, similar, although we have some uh, Casper and Thomas as kind of a sticking out at front. All right, so let's do a few more to get a bit more feel. Uh, I forgot to click the second time. Ironically, in a surprising ending of the fascinating short story, The Most Dangerous Game, Rainsford once again assumes the position of hunter and it's cut off. It is a description. Um, so it makes certain um, it, it is a little bit tricky because uh, 
uh, I didn't notice that the end of this is, is missing. That's where the claim was. Uh, the rest was just kind of a, a bit of a waffle, right? Um, so the, 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 there are some um, kind of elements in here. So we, we have kind of some sort of opinion or some sort of claim that something is ironic, uh, something is surprising. Uh, and then, so we have kind of a preamble and then, yeah, so it, it is broken because the, the answer was actually in, in the part that is missing. So let's, let's skip it. Um, I will uh, fix it. Poet, there is a typo. So Robert Frost, an American poet, has his work originally published in English before it was published in America. No hiccups here. It's a statement, right? So it, it is, um, it is um, a fact that can be checked. Uh, it doesn't need to be proved. Uh, it, it is something that is kind of easily be easily look up. Uh, you, you can kind of look that up. Uh, so, and it is, um, um, yeah, it's, um, uh, it's, um, I, yeah, I would say a description probably. Yeah. Okay, next one. This, I hope it fitted as well. Some of them have been longer than the limit. So let's see. The connection between the speaker and Annabelle in Edgar Allan Poe's hunting poem demonstrates that the true love is entirely possible at a young age. Yes, it is a claim. Um, you could, uh, we, we will talk a little bit about it in a minute, about arguments, because we have some sort of um, uh, preconditions and then kind of a, a claim that something demonstrates something else, right? But this basically makes it into a claim rather than into an argument, right? Um, so we, we will talk about arguments later, uh, but you know we we basically claiming that something demonstrates something else, and that is a claim, um, because that requires an evidence that requires some sort of a proof or some sort of a um, um, element of confirmation. Um, all right. So then we have one more. Yeah, another hiccup. I, you know, that's not an option. That just I didn't delete it. Something when preparing uh, the the question. Uh, again, it's a claim because we have uh, something that expresses something else, right? So we have kind of a structure of such, you know, of claiming that this expresses this. Uh, is it a fact? No, it's not a fact. You, you need to provide evidence that this expresses this. Uh, so if it is not a fact, then it's a claim. Um, so it was kind of a similar with the other structure uh, where we had uh, that something demonstrates something else. Again, that's kind of a claim, right? So the question from Shurai is, um, so can a perfectly verified claim be considered a statement or you mean a fact? Uh, because statements can be wrong. I, I can have a false statement and it's still a statement. Uh, but 
a fact is cannot like we, we distinguish between facts and claims. Uh, a fact is something that is um, considered true and doesn't need to be proved to be true. Whereas with claims, it's considered true, but it's considered internally true. But you you know you can provide evidence that a particular claim is false. Um, you know the the word fact got a little bit washed out these days because we have the fake news and we have kind of a uh, fake facts. <laughs> we have this kind of new concept which we didn't have before because facts were always facts. Like you know they are true by by the definition of being a fact. Uh, so I'm not sure like how the philosophers deal with this right now. We we don't really need to deal. We can kind of assume that a fact is considered like already verified and it's always true, whereas a claim needs to, to be sort of um, verified. Um, so the answer is yes, uh, if, if you change a statement into a fact, I would, I would say yes, but there is a disclaimer that, you know, the world is changing and we live in a bit of a relativistic facts world a little bit, so uh, which, which is nonsense, of course. Um, so, all right, so let's see how we're doing this time around. Um, <laughs> so Ben took the kind of a trigger finger working better and he took the lead. Excellent, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations, Ben. So I took those uh, from this quiz. Uh, you can check, there are like 20 questions and you can kind of test yourself on those longer ones, which I kind of broke. Um, so now we, we have, I kind of allude to this a little bit. Uh, what is an argument? So again, those, those of you who watch the videos, you will, should have no difficulty answering. Um, those who didn't, yeah, think what is an argument? A group of claims that we use to support our main claim. Yeah, a chain of claims. So just a chain of claims, um, you know, uh, is not necessarily an argument. So you need this element of connecting the, the claims with a claim, right? Um, yeah, so a series of claims that ends with a particular claim, with a particular conclusion. So that's what an argument is. Um, yes, you can say that, but that's not, that's not the meaning of the word argument that we use for in the context of critical thinking. So an argument is as this definition goes, is a kind of a opposing opinions uh, and they are expressed uh, in a way of trying to establish something or trying to argue something um, that, that is true, that in a, a common uh, colloquial definition, that's correct. Uh, we mean it in this more formal uh, way. Yeah, so... It's a sequence of statements or claims that seek to support or disprove a particular claim. Um, yeah. It is a group of facts, information, and other claims that support our goal claim. Correct, all correct. Uh, so now, um, that, now it becomes a bit tricky because uh, if I have um, if I have just one claim and I say this claim supports and proves this claim, would you consider it an argument or, or one claim supporting my conclusion doesn't make it into a valid argument? Would a single claim argument make it an argument or it would not be sufficient to have just one um, 
one claim. So Lama suggests that it depends on how strong this claim is. Um, but I don't think one claim can be. Um, Leon says the number of claims is irrelevant. I can make as many claims as I want that support my original claim, but that doesn't make it true. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, my, the question is, can you just use one claim? If, if, imagine the situation that I did use just one claim. Um, what that would mean if I have claim A and I say, because claim A is true, claim B is true. What would that mean? I like abstractly thinking. It's really hard for me to think of a, of an argument that would uh, make sense. I can make arguments that don't make sense. So for example, I can say, um, you know, outside I don't see a sun, uh, therefore uh, I will not go uh, skiing today. Um, that's, you know, uh, an argument. I have uh, a, a claim that outside there is no sun. And then another uh, statement claim that I will not be skiing today and I joined them um, and that make does it make it into an argument or not so let me uh, let me open an editor um, so let's let's do this so I have um, I have uh, the the weather is not sunny. Therefore, uh, Marius will not ski today. Is is that um, is that an argument? Is it sufficient? for the argument to have just uh, uh, one claim to support my uh, concluding claim. So le let's imagine like abstractly speaking, I have uh, one claim uh, which says X and therefore I have my concluding claim which is Y. Right? What would that mean? Like if I have an argument like this, what would that mean? That would mean effectively that X is Y. Yeah. Or that X infers Y, right? Uh, so, but for this, I have to have a little bit extra. So without anything extra, I, I only have that, right? So here, this is not an argument yet. Uh, I can make it into a, an argument and say, um, and Marius only ski in sunny days, therefore Marius was not ski today. Right. So the weather today is not sunny and Marius only ski in sunny days. Therefore, Marius will not ski today. That will make it an argument. Uh, but if I delete this second one, it kind of, it, it's not an argument yet. It's like, uh, it's partially broken. Like it's, um, it doesn't make sense. Um, So Elizabeth suggests I will copy that uh, so everybody can see uh, because the people watching the video will not see the, the chat. So here we have um, another example. And 
And I would say it is, again, it looks like there is one claim, right? It looks like there is one claim which leads to the concluding claim. But in fact, uh, we have more claims which we imply, which we don't have here, but we think, you know, we take them for granted, right? Uh, so for example, one of those is uh, radiation is bad for you, right? We, we do assume that, like if we don't, then this is not an argument. Like it, it's still like there is a dangerous radiation outside. You should not go outside today. Um, or you, you may need something like a dangerous, dangerous things should be avoided, right? Assumption. If, if we don't have this extra thing here, uh, it's not an argument yet. Uh, yeah, there is a dangerous radiation outside. Yeah, so what? Uh, it doesn't lead to this or links to this at all yet. We, we do need something extra. We need this assumption either like, you know, radiation is unhealthy and unhealthy things should be avoided or dangerous things should be avoided. Uh, so something uh, must be avoided. Uh, either the dangerous part or the radiation part. Uh, and therefore, you should not go outside, right? Um, so with a single claim, like, it, um, yeah, the, the original question was, can we have an argument which has only one claim, which leads to one claim? And the answer is no. Uh, you cannot really have a proper argument like this. So if you have something that looks like an argument that it uses a single claim to lead to another claim, then it's not an argument. Um, but the other comment is that we just ca can have as many uh, uh, claims as we need uh, or, uh, or as we throw in, uh, that's correct. Um, also, we can have some things that um, like, let, let me do this. Uh, so let's say, I have um, I have y, and I have a third claim which is z, and then I say my conclusion c is 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 true, right? I have a structure like this, and those x, y, and z are completely unrelated with each other, right? I I say something like um, you know uh, today is not sunny. Uh, there are um, how many, like um, 20 participants in IMT 4306 lecture. Um, uh, Bitcoin price is, I don't know, 32,000 US dollars. Uh, therefore, the world will end tomorrow, right? Um, is that is that an argument? Uh, it's a bad argument. Yeah, I would say it's not even an argument yet. Uh, for this to be an argument, I would need to link somehow those claims. Uh, I uh, yeah, of course I can link them with and. Um, yeah, then, then it looks like an argument, but there is no link between the claims and there is no link between the claims and the conclusion. So uh, you could say it's a bad argument or you could say that that's not even an argument yet. Uh, you, you need this link, you need this kind of a linkage uh, to, to, for it to, to make it into an argument. Um, all right, so... Um, why are we discussing this? Uh, because arguing is what you do in your writing, in your paper. Uh, you, yes, so, so Lama comment that claims need to be connected somehow. That's a kind of a pre-requirement for an argument to be an argument. 
Um, we can have you know, bad arguments, we can have weak arguments, it, we can have things to do with arguments, but typically we don't want the argument to be broken just fundamentally. So again, if I have, uh, if I have claims A, B, C, and therefore uh, D, I want them to be uh, debatable. Uh, so for example, I may have some weak evidence for A and strong evidence for B and C. Therefore, D, I may have kind of a weak support because A is weak, right? Uh, I want to do this type of reasoning and I want to do this type of discussion. I don't want to be discussing things that are completely unrelated in this kind of way. So if, if I don't have a proper argument, any subsequent discussion about this argument or any subsequent sort of analysis or whatever you, you have to do, yeah, it's already broken. Like you, you, you already starting with a kind of a fundamentally yeah, broken system. But if your argument is correctly structured, if you have kind of a good structure of your, of your argument, and then you can demonstrate that this we have uh, weak evidence, therefore, you know, that undermines D, but if we can demonstrate, um, so, so you can say originally, you know, that was the state of the art, of the art, I did work for A, right? So in my master thesis, I've done kind of a lot of work to demonstrate that A is supported, uh, therefore, I kind of strengthen D, right? Uh, so, uh, now I kind of turn the weak support of A into a strong support of A, and then I have a strong support for D. Um, so then it kind of makes sense. Um, and it, it, that's what we want. We want the arguments to be kind of a properly uh, organized and properly structured. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's have a break. Let's come back uh, quarter past two. And we will continue this uh, discussion about arguments and about the um, yeah, the kind of a critical thinking aspects. So 10 minutes break, come back at uh, quarter past two. So let me set up a timer. And we will have 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, Marius? Yes. Uh, like, yeah, just let people go to break. But uh, the things you kind of mentioned here is one of the problems I had during the scientific methodology course that I felt like it often stated that if you were ki experimenting or testing something, mm -hmm. you should always kind of have a result that kind of makes sense or the evidence or whatever should always support your claims or your theories. Mm -hmm. But I always felt like, how do you even know that the results you get is kind of correct? Um, yeah, that that is a, that's a very good question, um, and it, it um, the way the way we work, uh, especially the way we as kind of computer scientists or engineers work, uh, we sometimes do it um, bottom up. Right, so mm. you often tinker with things, and you kind of um, start with um, <laughs> with experimenting or with experiments, and you build a certain understanding or you build a certain evidence for something, uh, and they initially it's disconnected. Uh, so it might happen like, and it often happens. Uh, I I've seen it like uh, a lot of times with um, with master students. So what, what happens is you kind of, um, you, you do A, um, then you do some B, you do some C and you do some D, right? And then uh, in, your, in your thesis, you kind of write, um, you, you um, write about A, B, uh, C and D in sequence. Uh, and then you kind of say, uh, because of this, I think, and, and then you make some claims, right? Mm. Uh, and, you know, then you, uh, you make claims. And that's kind of a wrong structure. That's how we work. 
but that's not how you write your thesis or that's not how you write the report. Yes, you, you kind you of want a hypothesis and exactly. then create your, yeah. That's right. So so yes, you did that in sequence. Yes, you've tried those, those things and so on, but maybe the logical uh, connection is that, you know, what really you need to start with is D because from D you can kind of uh, do something with C and then having kind of a D mm. and C you can say, therefore, you know, something, right? Um, so we reorganize it like the chronological order doesn't matter. The mm. order in which you've done your experiments doesn't matter. What matters is kind of a logical connectivity between what you have and what it leads to. Uh, and also sometimes what it leads to is not, um, it's not strong that it directly leads to, it's kind of a, a weak evidence. We, we're gonna discuss a little bit about it um, oh, yeah. in, in a moment, but- um, It just felt that it was kind of relevant to the, one of the things that was kind of pushed through the scientific methodology course was uh, during validity and to quote the book or whatever, validity is the extent to which the results really measure what they are supposed to measure. And I feel mm -hmm. like you are always kind of trying to measure or what are you even trying to measure during some experiments or testing? You don't know the outcome at all. Yeah, that's right. So, so it's kind of hard to say that we tested A and we got B, but we don't know if that's kind of valid or if it's not because we had no clue what the experiment would show us. Exactly. So, you, you know, there are three things here. So one thing is how you present uh, present your results, um, experiments, and data, and like your work in general, right? Mm. And you always present it in the logical, structured way, the way the course was telling you, right? Yep. That's how you present, okay? Uh, the second thing is how you work, right? And here you have kind of a top-down approach in where you start with some hypothesis or some predefined questions. Uh, and then you design the experiment to either prove it or disprove it, and then you execute it, right? Yeah. Uh, and that you can do for some things. You already know, like for example, you, you did that for your uh, bachelor with some of your uh, experiments with uh, uh, perception or some, some usability. Right? Yeah. You, you know what you need to measure. You set up your experiment, you measure it, and then you have evidence whether you, you support it or not, right? But as you mentioned, I don't know if you entirely remember our bachelor, the last bachelor project we had together, yeah. where we were supposed to measure what is best, A or B. And yeah. then suddenly <laughs> C appeared and just ruined the entire thing. Exactly. So then you're doing it bottom up. Um, so bottom up. And then uh, exactly that's what you said, right? You, you're kind of comparing A and B. So you're saying uh, A versus B, and then suddenly you have C, right? So, yes. you know, people are testing some drugs for a uh, heart disease, uh, and then suddenly they see, you know, uh, the male participants have erection, right? The yeah. drug is kind of good for, you know, keeping some things up. Um, so, and they invented Viagra, right? They were not yep. actually doing any experiments with, with the drug for erection problem. It was kind of a negative side effect of another research, which was about a heart disease, right? So yeah, yeah. then you, yeah, you kind of revert it. You, you again, start doing something else. So if you're doing, you know, A versus B and C shows up, well, you have to change your original questions. You have to change your top-down perspective, right? Oh yeah, we had to redesign the entire thing. Exactly. C appeared. I mean, it took us a while to actually understand that C was an actual result and yeah. not just an accident, but it was still kind of, oh, this is new. Yeah. Now what? That's, I mean, that's what is kind of exciting in the research that if we knew everything from, you know, from before and we do everything top down, well, you know, we didn't would need to do research anymore because mm. it would just be done, right? But it's not. Uh, so we know certain things which we can plan top down, but not everything can be planned top down mm. and not everything can be done top down. So you do have this element of unexpected and you do have this element of discovery. But, but again, when you, when you have that, 
you don't say, oh yeah, we were doing this and this and this happened. No, 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 you kind of go back and you present it in a logical way as if you already knew that, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, often we, we, we need to do this this way because that's how you present your arguments and that's how you present your results, but that's not how things happen. Uh, they, there is a lot of um, agility and a, a, a little bit of uh, randomness and a little bit of a chaos on Different how, habit. yeah, how but that's we, why we, I found the uh, scientific course kind of strange that they were kind of very much focusing on the results you get should kind of align with what was it was expected or general con uh, con yeah, consciousness. Mm -hmm. And then, then we're back to if you already kind of know what, what the result should be, are you really experimenting or testing? <laughs> But uh, then you're back to the difference between an experiment and then tests. It's like, what happens if I light this on fire? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, as I'm saying, like sometimes you do have controlled enough experiment that you don't have those unexpected things. Hmm. Uh, and then you're following this kind of a ideal methodology, right? So you're saying, I have my, I have my null hypothesis, I'm collecting my data and I'm either proving or disproving the, the hypothesis. Uh, but sometimes it's not as clean. And if it is not that clean, just carry on, carry on with the work. And once you know, then you make it clean again, but then you change the frame of reference. You now not doing A versus B versus, uh, A versus B, you're doing A versus B versus C, right? Yeah, uh, or change it so you can do a yeah. proper A versus B. Exactly. So yeah, it's an iterative approach. It is, yeah. But yeah, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So we um, we almost just have the break for chatting about the reality of doing your projects. And I I mean, you need to do both. You do need to do the stop down at some point as well. Uh, and also like for presentation, for writing about it, you have to pretend that you've done everything top down. Uh, because that's the way you actually present your, your stuff in, in the master thesis. So even if you didn't, it still appears as if you did, right? Um, which is kind of counterintuitive because it may feel like you're kind of hiding something because it's not how it, things happened. But nobody really cares how things happened. What we care is what's true and what's not true, right? So, I mean, I don't really care uh, you know, when you did your experiments, how you did it, what you've been eating while you've been doing it. What I'm kind of interested in is like, okay, what, what I can learn? What, what is true that I didn't know or I didn't have a, a support for that you demonstrating that is true or, or false, right? Uh, that's what, what is important at the end of the day. Uh, so don't write your thesis as if it's like a chronological thing always write it as if it is a logical thing. And that's what the course was about, to kind of force you to this logic. But as I'm saying, that's not how we work. That's always how we present the work, but that's not necessarily how we work. Um, the iterative approach should be relevant again in the methodology uh, subchapter, shouldn't it? Or how uh, you attack correct. the problem statement. Correct, yes, correct. Uh, but you should still have it in a chronological, this is the complete thing in your conclusion, etc., and the results. In the plan, the chronology is important. And uh, the execution of your, of your plan, of course, the chronology is important. Uh, but you, in, in some, um, it depends how you, like what is the uh, original research question and how much Vari uh, variability you have in there. If your research question is quite well framed and you don't have those a lot of those unexpected things, you just need to kind of reframe it slightly, then you can kind of pretend everything was top down from the start and then you just kind of, uh, you know, change your top uh, title and, and slightly reframe it kind of at the end of the process. And you sort of pretend that everything chronologically was done as it was without discussing this adjustment. But if your research topic is in the area of emerging technologies or emerging things that you actually don't have this well-framed frame of reference to start with, and you're doing this iterative approach, 
then of course you should explain like how your main hypothesis was modified or was changing throughout the process. Then yes, the chronology will be kind of a, a, um, an important aspect of how you're presenting your, your final um, results, right? Does it make sense? Yeah. All right, so let's continue. Um, so I have um, another question for you, an open-ended question, uh, which is, um, what is a fallacy? What would you say a fallacy is? A false statement. No, a false statement is not a fallacy necessarily. Trying false claims to support the arguments or relative claims, a wrong claim, invalid statement. Um, all right, so let, let's first establish, you know, uh, is fallacy about statements? Is fallacy about claims or is fallacy about arguments? Arguments. Fallacy is about arguments. So if fallacy is about arguments, then uh, it's not about statements. It's not about claims. It doesn't matter if it's false or not. All right, so first- Actually, I was, I, I was the one who was trying false claims to the argument, but it was supposed to be in relative claims. Okay. Uh, is a logical, it, it is a logical falsehood that uses logic to undermine reality. Yeah, there is something to it. Uh, an argument which uses faulty logic to support the claim. So those two are kind of linked. Uh, an argument based on false claims um there is something to it as well um but not necessarily false okay um so uh, let me just bring up uh let's just google it um fallacies list of fallacies so we have a wikipedia page so we have um Okay, so the definition according to Wikipedia says a fallacy is a reasoning that is logically incorrect, undermines the logical validity and blah, 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 right? Uh, let me hide it for a moment. Um, so give me an example of, uh, of a fallacy, like from your, uh, from your real life experience of an argument which is based on fallacy, like some simple one. Like maybe when a kid wants a candy and we tell them that the store is already closed by lying, maybe. Uh, yeah, that there is something to it. So so lying is uh, is is. Um, but uh, let let let's use the kid, right? So the kid says. Um, um, so we we have the the child situation, and the child says, "I want the candy." Therefore, uh, you should go to the shop and get me candy, okay? Uh, first of all, it's an argument with just one claim. <laughs> so we already know that's not enough. Um, so there is a certain assumption the kid is making, right? Uh, so the assumption is that um, candy is uh, very important to me. <laughs> no, it's the same as I want candy. Um, what is the assumption that we are making here? Any suggestions? It's kind of an important assumption. So the, the kid wants candy. What will happen if the kid doesn't get the candy? I will not stop crying. Yes, so I am 
emotionally emotionally distressed when I do not have candy, <laughs> right? I will be, I will continue to cry. Um, um, so this is the argument the kid is making, right? Uh, the kid is making an argument saying, I want the candy and I will be crying because I'll be emotionally distressed when I don't have it. Therefore, you should go and get me candy, right? And this is a fallacy. It's called emotional reasoning, right? The kid is doing an emotional reasoning, uh, yeah, appealing to emotions. Uh, appeal to emotions is something else. So appeal to emotions will invoke emotions in the kind of receiver. It will kind of uh, evoke some, some things here, but you, you can have it, it, it is linked. Um, you know, um, but you know, we, we, we kind of have this, we can fix it um, by adding additional things. So we can, for example, say um, when and, all the claims are connected with and uh, here. So I want the candy. I am emotionally distressed when I don't have a candy. I cry when I am distressed. Um, you do not want a crying kid. Therefore, you should go to the shop, right? The kid could make this argument. Right, and in, in, implicitly it kind of makes this argument, right? Uh, and we can turn it into appeal to emotions, appeal to emotions by saying, I, um, you will, you feel better when your child does not cry, right? So therefore you should go to the shop and get me candy. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it's kind of follows logically, um, but it's a fallacy. It, it actually doesn't make logical sense to, to, to an extent. Um, <laughs> it's a very demanding kit, yes. Uh, so emotional reasoning or appeal to emotion is kind of a fallacy. In general, anything to do with emotions has nothing to do with reasoning. So, um, you know, if you see some arguments and you have some arguments which are uh, therefore C and any of them has to do with emotions, uh, most of the time, unless you are actually arguing about emotions of psychology context or, or of some sort, you know, uh, that, that most of the time is a fallacy. Uh, what are the types of fallacy um, you you have, which which often happen? You can have an argument uh, like this. Uh, uh, I um, let's say you are a nice person. Therefore, st still the kid with the candy, right? Therefore you should get me a candy, okay? Uh, yeah, what is that? Uh, typically we, we have it in a form of like this. Uh, uh, you claim such yeah, let's say you claim A and you are a bad person. <laughs> you are, you know, whatever. Uh, therefore, A is not true, right? Um, so that is a fallacy called ad hominem. hominem. Uh, it's kind of a personal attack, right? We, we kind of making something to do with you as a person or with me as a person or with somebody, um, you know, we, we can say Albert Einstein. Einstein claims A, you know, therefore 
you know, and implied again, implied, uh, you know, and Einstein is a well world known genius. Therefore, A is true, right? He says, you know, the best music instrument is violin. Therefore, violin is the best world instrument because Einstein said that, right? Uh, appeal to authority, exactly. Authority, and the list goes on, right? So we we have this kind of uh, a list of uh, patterns of arguing, which are demonstrably false because they have something fundamentally wrong with them, right? So we have a certain structure of argument. Uh, it, ha it, can to, it can to do with the uh, logical connection of the arguments. It may to do with the type of the claims which are used. It may to do with the nature of the claims which we are using as, as uh, validating the, the argument, uh, which form the fallacy. Uh, and because we have, um, we have those um, um, formal and informal fallacies, uh, being aware of them helps you to be a better researcher and a better author because you will try to avoid falling uh, into a pattern that you should not fall into, right? Um, so uh, Benjamin says, fallacies when you discard an opinion due to uh, them using fallacies, using fallacies does not always invalidate the argument. Of course, yeah. I mean, um, that is a good point. I was uh, talking about the fallacy, fallacy, not fallacies. So yeah, yeah, fallacy, fallacies. Yes, that's right. Uh, so you, you know, I mean, um, yeah. So the, in general, you can have this. Uh, in general, you can have something like this: uh, A, B, C. Uh, therefore, D. Okay, I have an argument, uh, and then somebody says I can demonstrate that A, A is false. Uh, therefore, therefore D is false, right? Uh, that is, that, you know, that um, sometimes correct, but you invalidating A doesn't mean that D is not true. In general, it only invalidates that this argument, let's call it uh, argument um, one, is false, right? So if you say, I have this argument, and you demonstrate that A is false, you cannot claim that D is false, because you don't know if D is false or not. You you only know now that argument one does not lead to D, right? That is the outcome of, va of va um, invalidating A, right? Um, all right. Um, yeah, the list is quite long. Um, I haven't went through all of them myself, and I often fall uh, into a wrong, um, you know, um, fallacy. Uh, but it is kind of good to study it a little bit. Yeah, man, the list is really long. Um, let's uh, let's do one more Google search. Uh, so let's say logical fallacies. And let's look at pictures instead. Um, and usually you have uh, things like this. Yeah, we had this one, I think, in game lab. Uh, so we had kind of an ad hominem, a uh, strawman, uh, kind of a, a, a typical ones, uh, which kind of give you uh, like a feel of what the fallacies are about and what you should try to avoid and uh, what. Um, you know, uh, what Ben is saying is that if you can demonstrate that somebody is using a fallacy, it doesn't mean that they, the final claim is wrong. You're just demonstrating that the argument is faulty and they need to use a different argument. Uh, the thing is when you're writing uh, a thesis, um, you should not use a faulty argument either through a fallacy or 
by other means because the reviewers will point it out and they will point out why your concluding things are not valid, right? So the, the first thing is you should not use a fallacy. Um, so first of all, um, you should, um, yeah, let me kind of clear that up and say, um, the most important is avoid, avoid fallacies. Those are really easily spotted uh, by reviewers and they will kind of um, uh, dismiss your final claims, right? The second thing is you have to assess uh, how, strong your, uh, how strong your evidence for claims is and how strong your conclusions are, right? So often than not, we don't have like if, if we have a b and c let, let's say a, a, a very general abstract structure of your thesis uh, and you've demonstrated n b and c uh, therefore d uh, you have to be aware of limitations of your demonstrations so even if the, they are connected logically everything is fine um, certain evidences are not uh, making those into facts, right? Um, if those are like, if you can beyond any doubt kind of make this into a fact, this into a fact and this into a fact, which you can in mathematics, uh, sometimes you can provide a proof that A is true, B is true and C is true. Therefore, you know, D uh, follows from that. If you can kind of uh, make it into a, a math-like proof, then you can kind of beyond reasonable doubt claim D. Uh, but in our circumstances, we often cannot do that. Um, what happens is you have a very, very strong belief that you believe D is true and you have some evidence that D is true. And then you get a reviewer which suggests that maybe D might be true, might not be true, right? Uh, that your argument, like your argument one that you have is solid like it, it's sound but it still doesn't um invalidate another argument which would make it into not d right um you have to take that into account we had a student a couple of years ago which was quite unfortunate because he was very uh, enthusiastic and very um uh, uh convinced that the evidence that he demonstrated uh, beyond reasonable reasonable doubt uh, proved D. Okay, I will not tell you like uh, the details because I, you know, for privacy reasons. Um, but then we have the re reviewer who was saying, "Yes, I agree with most of it, uh, but to claim D." You would also need to claim E and F, and we don't really have that, and you haven't considered that, right? So in the co constraints of the study, you've only considered an A, B, C, and in that context, D appears to be true, but maybe if you considered E and F also, then not B will be true, right? Um, so uh, you know, within a certain context, the student was right, within the bigger context, the reviewer was right. Uh, and then we had the conflict, like the, you know, uh, so in, in, your, uh, in your thesis, you have a section which is called uh, limitations, right? Uh, limitations of your study, uh, of your study. And that is to discuss what you didn't take into account, right? This is to discuss this. Uh, such that you make it explicit that yes, if I consider E and F, uh, my concluding remarks might be different. But if I don't, which I didn't in my study, that's what the limitation is. Like, you know, I didn't consider E and F, I could have, but I didn't. Then D is the, the concluding uh, uh, remark. And it is beyond reasonable doubt if we consider A, B and C only. Uh, but the limitation of the studies always exist. Like we, um, unless, again, unless you're doing something very uh, specific and you're using math to make your uh, assumptions and then to lead to, to the conclusions, then you don't really need to 
but even in math, you, you do need to take certain um, um, axioms, certain things as given. And then it depends if you took one less or one more, and then you may end up with slightly different results, right? Uh, we, we have those in, in math too. We have certain theories which are true for set theoretic math if we take certain assumption in or not. Uh, the, the theory changes, like the, the outcomes of the, of the proofs kind of change uh, depending on what is assumed and what is not. Of course, all the assumed things are kind of evidently true. We can, we, we, you know, in math, we don't assume falsified things, uh, but including or excluding particular assumption may ch changes the, the rest. And it's, it's the same here. Um, so, so bear that in mind. All right, so one final thing. Any, any comments on that or questions um, on uh, this so far? Yeah. I do have a comment about the fallacy part. Yeah. Uh, especially about the uh, fallacy. Um, oh shit, what, what's it called again? Uh, the expert opinion one, basically. Mm -hmm. As you, you mentioned, Einstein specifically, so I'll just continue using that one. Yeah. Uh, we are often through the te our thesis or project, etc., relying on expert opinion. Mm -hmm. And how do we kind of avoid then using the this in in a fallacy form? It's like if yep. I'm doing physics, I'm an idiot if I don't trust the words of Einstein. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, in in our circumstances, this is quite easy. Um, so you know we. We don't appeal to the authority of somebody. We appeal to evidence, right? So um, if if uh, you know uh, if person A, so person A did something and showed this, uh, showed that uh, B is true, then we can assume B is true, right? But it's not because person A is an expert but because what what that person did uh, so we refer a work that demonstrates something we don't uh, make the claim on a person itself or her, so, her, herself or himself I know. right so we are more putting our faith in the result and experiments and Correct. less who made it yes exactly yeah because basically e equals mc2 could have been proved by everyone and not just einstein and exactly. since his work was sound yeah yeah, that's right. But um, doesn't credential etc. matter, or should that those not actually? They kind should of not matter. Yeah, yeah, they should not matter, and they should not be taken into the account at all. Right. Um, that said, uh, there is a small twist to this. Uh, so uh, when we will talk about systematic literature review, <laughs> we will do that. So yeah, I was um, just gonna comment on that because if I'm gonna do AI, AI or whatever, I would look up who is the current leading authors in AI and then yes. have a look at their stuff and not That's whatever right. other way around because there's too much literature to just start a random place. So there is something called bias. Okay. Um, and bias is something that unfortunately is a big part of our work as, as researchers. We need to deal with it. We need to deal with it on our personal level. We also need to deal with it in our research, okay? So let's say you did a proper um, systematic literature review, and then you have, um, let's say, um, uh, yeah, yeah, let, let's use one case. So you have uh, one person, um, one person who is an authority, authority, which claims A, right? Uh, and that work, let's say, is uh, cited by, um, I don't know, let's say a uh, thousand people, right? And then you have a person, like you have hundred other people uh, who are not well known uh, and they claim not A and that work is cited uh, one million times, okay? Uh, then uh, what would you feel or what would you consider a stronger evidence? Uh, so, so let's say you do need to use not A, 
in, in your work because you need to use not A, B, and C to claim uh, therefore D, right? Uh, so then, you know, you have this uh, authority person publish something which is, uh, you know, uh, cited thousand times and he is a, or she is a well-known person. And then you have built up an evidence uh, which is like one mi million citations, which claims that this is wrong, that not A is true, right? Uh, so in, in your thesis, if you use this and use this reference and you said, yeah, that is a well-known figure in the field, therefore his result or her result is correct. Uh, versus this, well, you know, how, how would you like? What would you do? Well, one one, one thing here important is the um, the chronology. Uh, so if this happens first, so this happened and then this happened, then I would suggest that there is more stronger evidence for not A to be true because this non well-known people invalidated the authority, right? Um, and the, in any case, the authority doesn't matter, right? This can be neglected, right? I have a person A claiming something and I have 100 other people claiming the opposite. Uh, I will probably go with the, op with the majority, right? Uh, of the evidence. Um, how you weight um, how you weight the, the evidence is important. And you, you can make it arbitrary. You could, uh, as long as you make it explicit, you can kind of deal with bias the, the way you want, uh, but you have to kind of explain why, what was your reasoning and why you decided to, to include not A into your, into your work. Um, Yeah, I will talk a little bit more about literature review bias, like uh, once we get get to that. But uh, yeah, the appeal to um, the appeal to uh, authority is a little bit tricky, and using metrics like citations as a as a measure of how risky it is to claim a or not a depending on the citation things is also a little bit risky uh, so like for example when i was doing my phd work uh, there was one author who was quite controversial and he didn't have a lot of citations but i thought uh, he was more aligned with what i was doing and uh, he was like, the, the, the thing kind of followed a little bit like this. So majority of people claimed um, therefore D, right? Uh, he was claiming not D and you can say, yeah, but you know, th that is easy to resolve because you have this AB thing, ABC things, but he was saying A, B and C are correct. The people who claim D on this argument are correct with A, B, C, but I'm also cla claiming N and F, and therefore I'm claiming not D, right? And I was, in my work, I was using not D, uh, even though the bulk of work and majority of the published work was claiming D. Um, so um, <laughs> this is, um, uh, it, it had to do with the, with the machine learning, and with the uh, certain um, certain properties of how efficient a machine can learn something, right? And majority of people don't constrain how much space the machine has. They kind of assume the machine can use infinite space. And under this assumption, D is true. But what he was saying is he was saying that the machine has a constrained memory and the machine also has a constrained uh, time life such that you know the the size the, the the space and the time are both constrained and therefore some of the claims that in this context are true in this context are not true the the like certain um, proofs of efficiency which say how you know what is the limit of efficiency with the machine learning here are not the same as here and then uh, you know you have to go into details and then you don't go with the majority you go with the minority and in this particular case it was just one guy right so you know a lot of people publish stuff 
you know, thousands of researchers who claimed that this proof proves that that's the limit. And th there was this one guy claiming not. And I had to go kind of in detail of why he was claiming the not and why the not was true in my work, right? Um, so that was quite a lot of work to, to do that, but you have to un un unbundle that. Um, in most cases, yeah, in, in your reports or in your um, kind of evidence building, blog posts, kind of uh, news posts, uh, popular magazines, yeah, they're all useless. The, the popularity or the authority kind of doesn't mean anything. What, what works is evidence. Like if somebody demonstrated something, like you can point to the result, uh, that's what counts. And that's the way you avoid falling victim of the kind of appeal to authority fallacy. That, that was a bit of a lengthy uh, rant, I guess, but I, I hope it answered your question. Yeah, cheers. All right, so the, the final thing uh, that we uh, need to cover about not fallacies, about arguments uh, is easy. Um, we have typically two types of um, arguments. Uh, we have a deductive, um, deductive and inductive arguments. Um, what is deduction in mathematics? Do you remember um, some proof kind of things that you've done in math classes that were deductive and some that were inductive? What, what is the, the general difference? What, what is the general structure? And if you watch the video, then you should be able to, to answer that. So yeah, the you know uh, classic. Let's use a classic. Um, you know, uh, Socrates is a man. A man. All men are mortal. Therefore, Socrates will die. Okay. We have two claims, uh, we have one conclusion. Is it the deductive or inductive argument? Let's do another one. Let's say, um, uh, Benjamin will die, Marius will die, Sophie will die, um, all predecessors of Marius that do not live anymore <laughs> died. Uh, therefore, therefore, all men are mortal. So this one is a deductive argument. Um, this one is an inductive argument, right? <laughs> yeah. What's the difference? What is kind of a general structure here? So the general structure is that we go um, from general, from global to specific, to individual. And here is the reverse. So here we go from individual from specific to general, uh, to generalizations, right? Uh, here we already have from generalizations 
we have some claims kind of that uh, about specific or individual. Here we do the opposite. So the general structure of deductive arguments um, is from more abstract, from more general, um, from more abstract to concrete. And here we have from concrete to more abstract or to abstract, right? Um, that's the, the general pattern. Um, we use both uh, in your thesis and in your work. Usually the overall structure is in inductive. Uh, usually your, your thesis will have an inductive overall structure. Um, internally, you, for some of the claims, you may use arguments which are deductive and you should use deductive as much as you can, but overall it is harder to do pure deductive uh, reasoning or pure deductive arguments uh, because they are, you know, as, as we've seen with Socrates, uh, they are quite unchallengeable, right? I mean, it, it is really hard. Um, so all men are mortal. Uh, Socrates is man, is a man, uh, therefore Socrates, Socrates is going to die. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's actually such a strong argument. Um, so argument one is such a strong one that to um, to say the conclusion is not correct uh, requires invalidating one of those two claims. Like, you know, maybe Socrates is not really a human being, uh, which is really hard because it's almost like a fact here. It is kind of a fact. And then about mortality of people, um, you know, in, in, in fiction, uh, not everybody is mortal. We have those uh, characters which can live forever, but yeah, it, you know, you, you, um, you see where I'm going with it. It's, it's really hard to undermine this argument because uh, the claims, um, if, the, if I cannot under, undermine the claim, one or two, then the conclusion is solid, right? So uh, in the deductive claim, uh, dedu deductive argument, if the claims are shown to be true, the conclusion follows uh, 100%, right? So if in, in this argument, if the two claims are, are true, then 100% the conclusion is true. Um, with, the, with the second one, like I, I said, you know, A, B, C, therefore, you know, um, what was that? Uh, all men are mortal. Uh, it's a little bit harder to say that because uh, my claims, uh, this is true, this is true, this is true. You know, I'm going to die, Ben is going to die, and then whatever, you know, um, my grand grandparents died. Uh, but Daphina is gonna live forever. Like it turns out Daphina kind of will never die, you know, and she will invalidate this argument, uh, but just kind of refusing to die, right? So we have argument two, uh, where I have all my premises, all my claims true, uh, but the conclusion is still invalid, right? Um, I don't have, I don't have this 100%. Uh, here, I don't have the in inductive claims or in, in inductive arguments. I don't have a uh, hundred percent guarantee uh, of reaching the conclusion, reaching the generalization, right? Um, so what do we do? Like, what do we do if most of our kind of research work is inductive and we cannot have this hundred percent? Well, that that's exactly how science works. Science says, okay. Um, you know, I, I do this, I do A, B, C, uh, therefore D, you know, all, all men are mortal. 
unless you can demonstrate that for E, uh, that, um, you know, uh, unless you can demonstrate that E is true, right? So you can say, there is a claim and the claim is E is my claim for, for, for this uh, mortality thing. Uh, e says, um, if, uh, no, uh, there is person that never die uh, or never died, right? So if, if we can provide evidence for E, if we can showcase that, okay, here is the evidence uh, then we don't. Then we invalidate the inductive claim, uh, inductive argument. Uh, so we have certain inductive structure uh, where we say, I, you know, have evidence this, 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 and this. Therefore, I claim this. And if you can showcase this, then it will invalidate my argument, right? I still don't know. Like it, it will not necessarily invalidate the. Uh, the claim, right? S same as we were discussing before. So here we have D, right? All men are mortal. Even if you show me uh, a person who hasn't died uh, yet, like Daphina, right? Uh, she's still alive and she's a proof that, um, you know, um, maybe this argument is not true, right? <clears throat> um, but it doesn't mean um, D is wrong. It means argument two is wrong. Uh, it, 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 it's a weak argument. It's not a solid argument. Uh, but whether the people are mortal or not, I don't know yet, right? Um, so yeah, U usually what we do is we structure uh, inductive arguments in such a way that we provide the reviewer or somebody who wants to challenge us a kind of a claim saying, if you can demonstrate that this claim is true, then my argument falls up, falls apart, right? And in your in your thesis, uh, we often not do that kind of very strictly, but we do that in the limitation section. So, as I said, you you have this um, you have this limitation section, uh, limitations where you can say, okay, I didn't consider those things, and if those things are considered, maybe my claims are wrong. Oh, maybe my uh, conclusions are wrong and maybe my arguments are in, uh, invalid. Uh, you can also say what would invalidate some of your assumptions. So for example, if you're assuming A, uh, you can uh, express it in such a way that says, okay, A could be invalidated if B uh, can be shown true, right? So if B is true, then not A is true, right? But we don't have evidence for B. But if somebody produces evidence for B, therefore my argument, you know, my argument one falls apart, right? <laughs> exactly. So Yon, Yon is making kind of a, a, again an inductive, um, uh, it's trying to convert. Uh, it's kind of a, a very good example, actually, uh, because, yeah, I would point it here. So all migrant predecessors are dead. No living human known to us has outlived the oldest living predecessor. Uh, therefore, we will likely die one day. Yes, um, it has. It appears to have a little bit of a deductive structure because we use the qualifier all, right? We we going from general 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 abstract but it's only for the first claim. Uh, the second is very specific, right? It's a very specific claim. Like we don't have the single example which demonstrates that. Therefore, um, we, um, therefore, we likely die one day. And, you know, this is an indication, likely is an indication that it's an inductive argument uh, because we don't have this this kind of 100%, you know, what if I say likely here, right? If I say Socrates is likely, <laughs> uh, likely going to die, what would that mean? Well, it would mean we, you know, those two are not facts. Those two are not prov provably correct, which would undermine the entire structure of this thing. Like if those two are not, 
correct, then the whole thing is not correct. Therefore, Socrates is not going to die. Therefore, the conclusion is incorrect, right? It only works either they are correct and this is correct, or one of them is incorrect and this is incorrect. There is no space for likely here in the deductive way of arguing. Uh, you know, um, but in inductive way, yes. And that's kind of a, a, a well-structured inductive uh, argument, which kind of claims this uh, mortality thing. So that again brings me back to the um, to the discussion which I had about the structure of your thesis and about the final conclusions that we often um, don't claim the final conclusions with finality because there is this kind of uh, likelihood of how much can we generalize based on the evidence that we've collected. Uh, it, it is not universal. I mean, we, we do potentially have uh, a, a certain work. Like I, I had a master student who was working on the uh, crypto protocols uh, and he kind of uh, given a certain assumptions uh, deductively demonstrated some conclusion and there is no likely then that is it that you know that's the final conclusion and uh, there is no space for likelihood uh, but that's not often the case we often use users we often use some um, metrics such as um, you know um, even with performance you can measure some things and you can say this is better than this but you cannot claim that that's the best, right? Um, uh, it's quite funny when when uh, we do performance evaluations. So so like yeah, let's dive, dive, digress just for a second. Um, so let's um, yeah. So that's my final rant, and then we have a break. So if you're measuring performance, right? Uh, let's say you have a process P, and you're just interested in time. Right, so you have some some program, uh, and you want to. So I, I have program A and uh, program B, right? And then I can design an experiment which demonstrates which program is better. So I can say I can use um, I can run. Uh, well, I, I can one uh, run one time uh, program A, and I get kind of a time t one, and then I can run uh, one time program B and I get T2. And then if T1 is uh, longer than T2, I conclude therefore, uh, so let's make it into an argument. Uh, so I have, Kind of the result, therefore, uh, program B is faster, right? What's wrong with this one? So program B runs faster. Can I say likely here? Anyone? So T1 means uh, time it takes to run one time program A. And T2 means time it takes to run program B one time.
So uh, Lama is suggesting that likely doesn't fit here. Um, okay, so we have to make one uh, extra explanation. So um, when, um, let's do, let's do something else. Um, so let's say, um, so A is, um, a is an, uh, some sort of thing that I'm measuring. Uh, and like, like, okay, so here um, in case one, uh, A and B are computer programs. But let's, let's do the second case. And let's say um, I'm gonna um, throw a ping pong ball outside um, Jovic. A building. Okay, so we go outside, we stand uh, having a library on our back and um, uh, I'm throwing the ping pong ball uh, in front of me. And uh, so A, A is Marius and uh, B is Jon. Okay, and we have, to, and we want to measure the distance, right? So we measuring distance and then um, we concluding uh, that uh, B, uh, so if the distance of A, so um, uh, B throws uh, shorter than A. Okay, so uh, we want to establish if I'm a better thrower than Yon, uh, I, I throw the ball. We measure how far it it uh, flight until it hit the ground, and then he he throws a ball, uh, and then we conclude uh, B throws shorter than A. Um, can we say likely? Um, because what we want is like uh, we want to say B is a weaker thrower than A, based on this um, experiment. So we have some evidence. Like I throw the ball, he throw the ball, we have an evidence and we want to generalize it saying he, you know, throws weaker than I. Um, exactly, so Yon says, yeah, I would like to see more tests. I mean, you know, I, I, I just had a bad throw, you know, um, fair enough, right? Uh, maybe there was a wind, like I throw and I had wind with the throw and he had the wind against the throw, right? Uh, so he got, you know, uh, this, oh, he got distracted, right? Uh, so he says, no, 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 we cannot claim that. Like, you, you cannot even claim likely, like it's like, let's repeat it. Let's repeat it multiple times. I want to see more throws, right? Okay, so let's do this. Let's do average uh, of uh, the distance that we got from, okay, let's do 30 throws. Okay, um, so we do 30 throws now uh, and we uh, average the distance of the throws. Can, is it better? Jon, are you happy now? Well, I think now we can say likely. Exactly. So now we can say likely. Um, so now we have kind of stronger evidence that on average he throws shorter distance than me, right? Uh, and he said because of that. But it also depends a little bit of how the experiment was set, okay? Uh, because if we did this experiment on Monday, okay? So I've done done on Monday. And he did his experiment, his throwing uh, done on Tuesday, okay? Now, is the wind kind of screwing him over again, <laughs> right? Like if I have a good day and the wind is with me and I'm throwing 30 times, 
I will, all, of course, throw longer than him. And he said, I, uh, come on, I throw 30 times. Yes, we repeated the experiment 30 times, but you know, the wind was against me consistently on Tuesday all the time. You know, screw that, I, I don't want that, right? <laughs> so it, it kind of depends, like we should be both throwing on Monday interchangeably, hopefully, and kind of um, measuring like the outside influence on what are the additional factors that we don't take into account. Because, you know, there are factors that we are currently not taking into account. Those are the limitations, right? So one limitation is the wind. Uh, and then if we compare throwing on the same day, then the factor, which is the wind, is kind of random and it affects both of us kind of randomly uh, the same. But even though the wind is random, it affects me on Monday in a very consistent way and it affects him on, on Tuesday in a very consistent way as well. Therefore, the limitation is like, um, you know, it's a weak experiment again, right? So even though, and, and then if we do that and I say, okay, then let's repeat it, you know, three million times, like he, he, he's throwing kind of much more and I'm throwing much more, it doesn't help. It, it's kind of, you know, it, it's not much better than just doing it one, one time, right? If we have this wind effect affecting us both in different ways. So then repeating the, the experiment actually doesn't bring a new quality, doesn't help. What would help is uh, him throwing on Monday and me throwing on Monday and me and him throwing on Tuesday, for example, right? Um, because maybe there is a factor like uh, maybe I'm affected by uh, bright sunlight, right? And when I'm like, you know, uh, in the bright sunlight, I, I can't throw that well. Uh, and on, you know, Monday, we did or did not have a, a sunlight, right? And then Yon is not affected, right? Uh, so we have another factor that might affect our throwing. And again, you know, you need to design your experiment in, in kind of a certain way of, of how you're measuring it, right? Um, so th then um, the claim. A comment? Yeah. Uh, I'm just thinking also for me uh, that it's not really operationalized the problem statement because it's a weaker thrower. Uh, what you have only confirmed is who is throwing the furthest. It could be that he is throwing shorter but more precise. That's right. It's yeah, exactly. Good point. Yes, that, that's a very good point. So the definition of what it means to be a weaker thrower, I put in quotes uh, because it, it's uh, not defined here. Right. So the argument actually is moot uh, because we haven't defined what constitutes a, a kind of a, a stronger or weaker thrower. Is it the distance? Is it the precision? What, what, that, what do we mean? Yeah. Very good. Very good comment. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's have a break. Uh, let's continue uh, maybe 25 or uh, how long break do you want? Do you want 10 minutes? For me, 25 is fine. Yeah, all right, so let's start 25. Uh, so it's kind of a nine minutes. So I go to timer again. This time we're gonna use a Google timer. So let's do nine minutes. Um, all right. I'm going to go and drink something.
Hello. Can you hear me, Marus? Yes. Uh, do you have any plan regarding to the tomorrow, uh, another sl another slot of this week? Mm, I didn't. Okay. How do you think we uh, ask the students to uh, start to learn the LaTeX? Do you think they have any experience regarding that? Because they, I hope that they can utilize LaTeX for reporting, for example. Well, they can, for example, utilize it already for whatever tools they prefer. Yeah. But very good point. It's so easier. We can ask how, how many how many of of, of you guys um, uh, know LaTeX. I know some of them wrote LaTeX thesis for Bachelor, so they will be okay. Yeah, there are some answers. So how many of you are familiar with Overleaf? So who is familiar with Overleaf? Yeah. That's good, someone. But some others told us they prefer Google Docs. But, but typically we don't. Yeah, only to. We don't like. To go, ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So not, not everyone. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone is back. So maybe we ask it again, like uh, in one minute. But yeah, yeah, sure. I will just general discussion with you. But I, I agree with you. I mean, it would be very good to have an introduction to LaTeX and to Overleaf and to encourage them writing their reports and thesis in, in LaTeX, yeah. It largely depends on the scope and size of the report, et cetera, and the professionalism that is expected. Yeah. If I'm just writing a half a page reflection document, I'm not gonna bother setting up a later document because it takes forever to get started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I don't know, based on my personal experience, I think we utilize LaTeX and already for all documents, all scientific publications. So, so it is recommended that you familiar somehow yourself with uh, basic LaTeX stuff. And then uh, when you do the small projects for the course and uh, you can utilize LaTeX for the report. Oh yeah, definitively. If we're doing like a proper report or scientific stuff, obviously if or LaTeX is the way to go. But if it's just a small thing, I would prefer using Google Doc. But if it's anything scientific, mm -hmm. LaTeX is, yeah. 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 Easily my number one choice. Definitely. Like anything that needs um, references, I don't use anything but LaTeX. Yeah. Um, but for example, we do have some software development activities and sometimes like markdown in a form of a, you know, text file is enough. Um, sometimes, yeah, one page document on a wiki or on a Google Docs is okay. But for research, uh, for reports, and everywhere where I need to use uh, citations or references, I, I just hate doing it by hand. Like LaTeX is such a good tool to, to do that, that I, I never do it in any other way, yeah. I wish LaTeX was better when it came to images. Yeah, you know, it's not ideal, but it's okay. -ish. Um, and with Overleaf, you can kind of uh, very quickly get into the workflow and, and sort things out. So <clears throat> I always also feel that if you pass like 30, 40 pages in Overleaf and uh, with pictures and diagrams, etc., it gets so sluggish. Are you really? using the NTNU account? As far as I know, yeah. It make it takes a lot of time to co compile. It's the that compile that is true. Yeah, that is yeah. high. But you have to have the professional license with NTNU. If you're using your personal uh, account, then it's slower. It, it, it gets more um, laggy. Yeah, it would surprise me if I'm not using the professional, no, the NTNU, NTNU one. But yeah, it gets really laggy when you pass like 20, 30, 40 pages with pictures, etc. when you need to reformat mm -hmm. and, and et cetera, it gets... Mm -hmm. I say that, but if it passes a certain Google Doc link as well, it also gets really wonky. It doesn't okay. like you passing 20 pages. So guys, uh, one, one more time, can uh, people who have used or heard of Overleaf re uh, say that they did? Um, so anyone who has used LaTeX or Overleaf in the past? 
um, Leon, so one, two, three, maybe four. So it might be good to have um, have a session on, on LaTeX and Overleaf. Um, yeah, so some people in the chat, they are, they are saying that they did. Um, all right, so we, we can kind of discuss it and we could use one of the Fridays for, for this, for um, introducing some tools and some, uh, some things that would make you better. In, in fact, um, yeah, so let, let me talk with um, uh, Siu Xiang and then, yeah, we, we will let you know. All right, let's continue. Um, our Friday's lecture is supposed to be more practical or tool or introductory, introduction to say overly for whatever. Um, well, so, you know, historically I didn't run the second session. I, I run one week, uh, one session a week. And then the second slot was uh, dedicated for group work. Uh, but we can utilize the second slot for other activities in addition to group work. Um, so let me just quickly check how how large. Um... Yeah, so unless ending, like Dragana said, if ending, unless ending is specified, a Friday session is empty. Mm, yeah, so. Yeah, we have some preliminary discussion regarding your project work. And we were thinking that uh, we can utilize the Friday slot for uh, meetings with your with your advisor for example if we have a if we let's say we have 10 topics and uh, each group will work on a particular topic and you will have a you know, advisor who will supervise your topic and then in the fr friday slot you can work uh, together with your uh, advisor and he or she can follow your progress and give your advice and uh, deploy the next week's task something like that i just check the calendar um Whoops, let me quickly make it smaller. And it appears to me that the Friday session is gone. Really? So it is here. No, it is there. So I don't know why it disappeared from my calendar. It, it is still there. Uh, let me refresh it. Yeah, it is from two to four. So yeah, so uh, as as Su Xiang is, is saying, we can utilize it uh, for some additional activities. So what we can do is we can discuss it with uh, with him, and then we were planning to use it for the group work and for kind of guidance. So we would have kind of a more regular lectures on Thursdays, and then more of a group work, individual group work uh, with the supervisors on Fridays. So within your kind of individual groups, right? That would be sort of a, a group work space, but we, some of that space we can combine such that all groups meet and we talk about overleaf or something like this that is common to everybody. Then, you know, one person can talk about overleaf and, and everybody can kind of uh, benefit from it, right? Yeah. So we will keep it a bit agile. So Jon is suggesting we, we're gonna do a, a, you know, a little bit of an agile adjustment of what Fridays are. But because we haven't planned anything for tomorrow, then I'm not sure if we will run the session. What, what do you think, Sujan? Um, and I didn't have it in my calendar. So I actually have, <laughs> well, um, there is a, ah, yeah, because there is a, a first seminar, Max seminar tomorrow. You, you guys going there? There, uh, what now? Tomorrow on uh, 12 o'clock, 12 to, to 2, is the Max seminar. Have we gotten a notification about that? Kickoff meeting. Ah, uh, no, that's for second year. Sorry. It's, um, it's a thesis kickoff meeting for the second year masters. The... So, um, yeah. The current information channel seems to be a bit, yeah, not very good with Blackboard being updated and every, the new schedule being updated as well. And part of the university is off for some reason. So it's kind of hard to keep track. 
So what, what I suggest is uh, let's not, uh, because I cannot do tomorrow, I, I'm already occupied with the second years, uh, but what we can do is we can, um, I will put that in here, that next week Friday session we will use for Overleaf uh, and for LaTeX introduction, such that we can introduce uh, what LaTeX is and how you use it and how you use Overleaf and then people who never seen it they get kind of into the uh, another tool under their belt, okay? So we, we can do that next Friday. Um, and then the following Friday, I think we will already have projects in such that the groups can meet with the respective supervisors. So I will announce it and I will make it into the announcement in the issue tracker. Um, all right. So let me continue here. Uh, we covered the inductive deductive arguments. We covered the basics of critical thinking. So one small thing left is uh, this talking. Um, so uh, this is relatively simple. Um, you have to use this kind of, um, as, as I introduced early, kind of a proper register uh, of of what and how to say, right? So one thing that we've already covered was, and it's not covered here, is that you should not write chronologically of what you've done. It's not your, it's not a novel about your life experiences and about your journey through your um, master project or a project. It's a kind of based on um, evidence and claims and arguments that lead to the particular conclusions, then you have a discussion and you specify some limitations and you sort of do that in a proper logical way, like you, you had with the scientific methodology course. Um, the other thing is that um, you avoid using informal words. Um, so we don't uh, shorten the, um, the, um, the words. Uh, we don't use kind of a colloquial ac acronym. We don't use shortcuts. Um, and then often you need to convert some informal word into something that is a little bit more precise. Um, so workmate is considered kind of informal. You should use colleague and then um, gassing, you know, you should say, we were conversing and so on. So um, the, the, you have some examples here. Um, this assignment will look at the effects of globalization on economic stability. This, is my, this assignment will examine the effects of globalization on the economic stability, right? Uh, one is kind of look, the other one is examine. Uh, this one is a more precise, more, uh, you know, specific, like, what does it mean that the assignment will look at something? Uh, what does that mean? Uh, it's a little bit colloquial. It's kind of casual language, but it's not precise enough. If you say this assignment will examine, then it's kind of better, right? Um, the other example is the fragmentary structure of the writing gets across to readers a sense of the narrator's splintered consciousness. Uh, the fragmentary structure of the writing communicates to readers. Um, so again, we have get across, gets across and communicates. Um, both sentences say the same thing, but this sentence is more informal and a little bit more vague than the second one, right? Try to be precise. Um, so try to, to choose the words which are kind of more direct. Um, about kind of being precise and direct, um, you know, often you you ask how long the report must be, you, and the answer is like eight pages. So then you write, you need to write more, <laughs> longer sentences, more words. But that's not the point. Uh, the point is not to use more words to express the same thing. The point is to write about more things uh, in a short way. So. Um, it, if, if you can express something in one sentence and it's clear enough, you don't need three sentences. You can just use one. If you can say something in like two words or four words, just say in two words. Uh, being succinct and being kind of short, most of the time actually makes your work stand out more and, and benefit you 
right? So the, the B and A level work is not the longest. It's not the most, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, doesn't use the, the most number of words. Is the work that has done the most uh, and it's expressed in kind of a succinct and, and a very succinct way. It takes effort actually. So uh, what, what happens to me sometimes, I write an email, the email may have a page and then I take a short break and I rewrite the email and it ends up being kind of a half a page, like two, two shorter paragraphs. And that's a much, much better email. Uh, you don't need the long things. Like you, we often start with long things. So it's very good for you to, to write notes and to take notes on what you're doing on what you want to say. Um, and then you kind of rewrite them in a, in a, in a better, more precise way, right? Um, all right, so then there is um, um, the shortening. So we discussed that. Uh, you can you can check it uh, yourself, right? So we um, we want to avoid certain things that are often used in a colloquial language, and then um, be a little bit more formal and more precise. Um, here, it talks about kind of the academic register, right? Um, so this links back to some of the things that we discussed about arguments and claims and statements. So here we have industrialization caused a decline in religious belief, right? There is some evidence saying that in uh, industrialized during the industrialization process in England, uh, the uh, religious belief kind of uh, uh, declined, right? Uh, and you have one, one um, claim, and then you have a second one. It would seem that industrialization was accompanied by a decline in religious belief, right? Um, what's the difference? What's the difference between the first claim and the second claim? So um, yeah, so, so um, should, I, should I say a second claim is more of an observation. It is more of a um, observation or kind of a description of what has happened. And also it, it connects um, uh, the industrialization and the decline in the religious beliefs in kind of um, it it says they happen at the same time whereas the first one says one caused the other right uh, this this is true right this is true without you needing to defend it uh, because it has been observed that the industrialization and the uh, decline, they kind of happened like, um, you know, coincidentally, they, they happened, uh, you know, at the same time or that happened a little bit before that happened or, you know, they, they were kind of happening together. Whereas this one is claiming that this thing caused the other thing. And then it's a much weaker claim. It needs more stronger evidence to support it that it's true. Uh, this one, you don't, um, you know, it, it, it's almost uh, self-describing, um, like another example, science will one day explain everything. It could be argued that science has the potential to explain everything, right? So uh, this is a claim. What is this? Yeah, it's a statement, right? It's it's the same above, right? This one is a claim. We claiming causality. This one is more of a statement. Same here. This one is a claim. This one is more like a statement. Um, 
Many analysts now argue that the strategy of X has not been successful. You know, uh, many analysts say that lockdown has not been successful in containing the COVID, right? Um, Smith's analysis has been criticized by a number of writers. The most important of this criticism is that Smith failed to note that blah, blah, blah. Um, this is um, something we often say. We, we say most researchers do this. Uh, most research papers claimed something, something or uh, whatever, right? Um, it's very um, easily attackable, right? We, we don't, if, you, if we write like this, we expose ourselves to be easily kind of targeted by criticism that then, you know, how many, like, how can you say who the analysts are? It's a very vague statement, many analysts, like, you know, what does it mean many? Uh, what do you mean by analysts? Uh, how do they argue? Do they have, you know, experimental arguments? Do they wrote a theory? Uh, what do you mean it has not been successful? Um, whereas the second one is kind of a very um, uh, detailed. Um, so it, 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 again, it says, um, Smith has been criticized by a number of writers. Uh, well, we, we can kind of get away with this because we have the second sentence. Um, we can all, like we have, uh, Jones argues unconvincingly that blah, 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 right? Um, this, um, well, you, you, you would need to kind of convert it, right? You could, you, you, you would need to say, um, um, I mean, it's okay to, to do that, um, that he fails to, um, to argue his point, but it would be good if you could point out why also, right? Um, all right, so being clear and concise. So don't be too wordy, don't repeat yourself, don't waffle, uh, don't be confusing, right? So clarity uh being kind of uh succinct um so here we have this kind of uh two sentences um there are a number of factors that may have contributed to the difficulties faced by the government but the simple fact of the matter was that there was no change of the slightest degree with regard to the educational policy um, a lot of words um a number of factors may have contributed to the government's difficulties, but the fact was there was no change to the educational policy. It says the, says the same thing. This one sounds much more like an academic uh, sentence. This one sounds much more like a news uh, story on kind of, uh, you know, uh, media statement type of thing. So be short, like just say what needs to be said uh, don't use additional words uh, if you can. It, it's, it's more work. Often you start like this and then you have to rewrite it to this. We, we don't naturally are concise. I mean, I am not. Uh, I often write and then I have to work on making it concise. Um, but you know, a lot of people have that. There is a famous um, statement. I, I don't remember who said that, but he said, I would write you a short letter if I had more time, but you know, here is my long letter because I don't have time to, to shorten it, right? Um, all right, arguments versus opinion. Um, so um, children who have seen violence at home repeated when they grow up. A friend of mine from school whose father was violent is now in prison for attacking someone during a night out. Um, okay, international studies of sizable prison populations demonstrate that significant numbers of violent offenders have witnessed violence in the home as children, though the influence of the environment and genetic factors must also be considered. Um, we, you know, um, they kind of say the same thing again. Um, this says um, observing violence when in your childhood increases um, 
the coincidence of your violent behavior uh, in in the future, um, such that if you do kind of statistics, it kind of demonstrates that you know children who observe violence they may be involved in violent behavior later, but they they say it in a, a really different way. This one is clearly wrong, like uh, it doesn't matter if your friend. Uh, was violent or not, or is prison or not. Like people often say, uh, I have a grandmother, she is 110, she has been smoking her whole life, she has been drinking her whole life. Look, she's 110, you know, smoking and drinking doesn't have any impact on, you know, on health, right? They, they use this kind of uh, um, argument. Uh, don't do that. Uh, try to uh, be um, precise. And um, this sentence states that, um, that there is a correlation. Um, it doesn't say uh, there is causation, right? Um, so it says, demonstrate that significant numbers of violent offenders have witnessed violence in at home. It doesn't say the witnessing of violence at home caused them to be um, uh, violent offenders. Uh, whereas here it says children who have seen violence repeat it, right? So seeing the violence make them the offenders, right? There might be other factors, uh, but here we have this causation. Uh, and then the second one also states all the limitations, right? So it, it says, yes, there are studies which show it, but they have certain limitations. If you take those limitations into account, maybe this correlation between those two things is completely coincidental. Maybe there is no ca causality, right? Um, so this is kind of a typical, um, one of the fallacies that, that we often have um, is that um, we have um, so we say A coincides with B, right? Uh, therefore, uh, A causes B. So, you know, children seeing violence coincides with some violent offenders observing um, violence as children, right? Um, so what uh, it, this, this is often the case in, uh, uh, we had this discussions a couple of times in terms of games, because there is a lot of um, people who claim that violent games uh, make players violent. Um, so in, in here, uh, let, let's let's focus on, on this one with the offenders and with the with the children, right? Uh, so here we have um, you have a, a, a violent offender uh, who was a child uh, at some point. Uh, you have the normal person who was also a child, right? Um, and then you have uh, two statements. Uh, this one says. Um, if you are a normal person, and so let's say, uh, and you see violence, then uh, then you become violent offender, right? The second se the second sentence says there are studies which show that violent offenders, um, as child, uh, have. Uh, then, the, then they've seen the violence, right? Um, but let, and, and that is a significant portion, right? So the significant portion of violent offenders uh, seen violence, but normal people uh, seeing violence, we, so, um, okay, we know from studies that a uh, large number of violent offenders uh, seen violence. So th those two are kind of uh, coincidental, but 
the coincidence of how many normal people see violence uh, as children is uh, not known. Like we, we don't have study, like e even the second sentence doesn't say anything, right? Um, so what is the percentage of normal people who are not violent offenders, but seen violence as children? Um, I mean, neither of the sentences say anything, although this one implies that everybody who was a normal person as a child and seen the violence would become a VO, right? Uh, which is completely wrong. That, that, is, that, that, that makes no sense. We don't have any evidence for that. Uh, so there is uh, no evidence for that, right? So it's the same with games. So some violent people play violent games and then, you know, um, um, the uh, large number of V connects to violent games. In that in that subset, right? We have uh, another another set which is normal people play violent games, and we don't know how many of the normal people playing violent games uh, uh, become violent. Um, the, the study suggests like that we have this evidence. We have evidence that some people who have tendency for violence they like playing violent games. Uh, because they are kind of, yeah, they like it. They, 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 um, but, but we don't have this. And, you know, you have every year, you have some uh, research into this discussion showcasing some things, but it all boils down to causality uh, versus um, uh, coincidence. Right? Uh, so what causes what and what um, coexists with what, what happens, you know, uh, coincidentally. All right. Um, and then uh, you have kind of a test so you can check yourself. <laughs> uh, I did fail in few of those. So don't put yourself down if you don't do it perfectly. Um, all right, so uh, five minutes left. I have maybe 20 minutes left to talk about, but I think you can do it at home. So given that we don't have a session tomorrow, uh, please watch this tutorial. Uh, it's about 20 minutes uh, tutorial. And then uh, what I wanted to, to stress is this list of, um, um, of steps which you do while you're doing your systematic literature review. Uh, this is kind of self-explanatory. What I would like to use the last five minutes of is um, tell me what is, in your opinion, a difference between a systematic um, literature review and a normal literature review. So uh, in the systematic one, you identify your research question, yeah, you, you do always. You define your inclusion and exclusion criteria for the uh, references that you use. Um, you find all the relevant sources. So you search for your sources using the inclusion criteria. Um, you select based on the inclusion and exclusion criteria, which papers you're gonna use. Uh, you extract the data from the study you evaluate the bias. We, we talked a little bit about this before. And then you provide the results and assess the uh, quality of the evidence, right? Um, this is almost the same to the normal literature review, right? So what is the big deal? Like, can, can you tell me when would you like do a normal literature review and when would you do a systematic literature review? What's the main point of systematic literature review? Anyone? I know it's late. I, I cannot talk for three hours <laughs> straight. Um, all right. So the, the main difference is then it's the purpose of why you're doing a literature review. 
So why you normally do a literature review? You, you had to prepare, no, you didn't have to prepare yet, but you will have to prepare a project plan. And as a project plan, you have to prepare a literature review. Um, what is the reasons, some reasons why you're doing literature review? Okay, can you repeat that? Uh, to know what was done previously by yeah. another researchers. Okay, so one is uh, to learn, let's say, learn about state of the art, right? To learn what has been done before. Where, where is the current uh, level of knowledge? What are the, you know, uh, to learn what are the problems and solutions already existing in the domain, right? Uh, what, why, what else? So I would call this, uh, let's, uh, let's call it exploration, right? You're kind of exploring the field. You, you're checking what has been done, what other researchers do, what other researchers are researching. Uh, let's say you want to know what methods has been used in machine learning for this domain, what machine learning techniques people used for uh, this particular problem, uh, and so on. Uh, so that's one very broad category of, um, of motivations that you can have. What's the other one? And maybe also to make sure that you're exploring something that's novel and that you're not just, yeah, that you're trying to add to the um, pool of knowledge that it already exists. Yeah, that's good. So that that is again in this category. So it's like a, a check of novelty, um, check of contribution or kind of the, the scale of your contribution. Uh, maybe you want to check what are the biggest questions, biggest problems in a particular domain, right? Um, yeah, that's that's good. Um, what else? What else you might want to do literature, like, um, yeah, for, for those, uh, for those motivations, you can do both. Um, but what is the motivation that requires you to do the systematic literature review. So uh, it's, it's not really kind of black and white, uh, but um, if you doing exploration, if you want to learn about something or check something or get a feel of something or kind of uh, evaluate, can you kind of evaluate, evaluation is another one, evaluation, um, then you would do either one, but we tend to do just a normal literature review. Uh, but if you need, um, so if, if your motivation is exploration, it doesn't matter if your motivation is uh, the need to um, obtain evidence or claims. Claims. So, for example, if you say um, most researchers do something, right? Uh, the most researcher is a claim. Uh, and then to provide evidence that that claim is true, you cannot do just literature review. You have to do a systematic literature review. Uh, so I can say, I can do this. I can say um, there is evidence and I can cite uh, some papers, uh, one, two, three, one, you know, I have some citations uh, that smoking is very healthy for heart 
for preventing heart disease. Okay. Um, if my literature review is not systematic, this claim or this argument, um, um, or, or in this case, it's a claim, uh, is invalid uh, because I could cherry pick three papers from 50s or you know 40s, uh, which claim that um, particular thing is true, and it's not evidence at all for anything, right? Um, for if you're using references, if you're using kind of research as evidence for, for your claims, uh, you need a systematic literature review uh, because a systematic literature review weeds out kind of a, a selection bias, right? We cannot randomly refer to something and make claims because that is not um, sufficient. Uh, so if you need an evidence for backing up your claims, you need to do systematic literature review. If you want to just check things or learn about things, uh, normal literature review is fine uh, because you're not making very generalizable claims of, on anything. You're just learning like uh, about a particular thing. But here, if my literature review is not systematic, uh, this, there is evidence, uh, thing is is useless, right? All right, we we um, over time limit, so please um, uh, check this tutorial. Uh, how to do it? You will you will need to do it for your uh, master project because you will use literature as evidence for certain claims that you use uh, as um, in your arguments. Uh, Therefore, you know, it is a good skill to know how to do it and, and what you need to pay attention to. Uh, and then next week, um, I will post here what the schedule is and the next week, Friday, we will use for Overleaf. Um, if you have any questions, uh, yeah, uh, you can ask me now or you can post it on the issue tracker and uh, sorry for going over the, the time. So Benjamin, you have a question. Yeah. Uh, my questions are kind of unrelated to this specifically. So just to anyone before me. Okay. Any other questions before Ben? <laughs> Any questions related to the final point about systematic lead review? Okay. Go ahead, Ben. Uh, it was basically in terms of, I, I've gotten questions regarding the, um, integration projects in terms of workload and all of that stuff. Okay. Uh, please do come back to me. I'm getting harassed by Richard. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I will, I will do that. When is the, I think uh, first lecture is next Thursday or at least the seminar. Integration project. Um, okay, I will check it and I will get back to you before that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll just compose a Discord message instead of we can take it yeah. there. Okay, I guess. thanks. Any other issues? If not, you have a little bit of a homework. Just check those steps and check the little tutorial. And then uh, those of you who never used Overleaf or never used um, LaTeX, have a look and then on Friday we will kind of talk a little bit more about it. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you very much.